What prerequisite knowledge do you need for this lesson? Well, I guess it would help if you could add. Over and over again in computing, we create expressions that represent what it is we're asking the computer to do. Let's take an example. Let's assume that we have six rooms in a house, and each room has a length represented by x sub n and a width represented by y sub n. So the area of room n is x sub n times y sub n, right? All right, so that's the area of all the rooms. What is the area of the whole house or the whole building? Well, the area, and area, maybe a better word for area would be the square footage, but we have area is equal to, what is it, x sub 1 times x y sub 1 plus x sub 2 times y sub 2 plus x sub 3 times y sub 3 plus x sub 4 times y sub 4 plus x sub 5 times, are you getting tired of this yet? I know I sure am. So we get all the way up to a y sub 6. Wouldn't it be cool, number one, if there was an easier way to represent this? But number two, whenever we start to get an easier way to represent this, we also learn better ways to perform these algorithms inside of the machine. So adding elements like this, you know, so I've got, I've got this element, the area of one room, room one, plus the area of room two, plus the area of room three. Adding elements like this is something, it's a very common thing to do. For example, there are expressions that allow us to figure out the values of different trigonometric functions, all with summations, with these, with this long list of numbers that are being added together. And when I say a list, what does that make you think of? It makes you think of a sequence, right? So you've got a sequence of numbers and you're adding them all together. Another thing that's very common to add together is the different values of an analog signal, like a sound wave, in order for us to perform something called digital signal processing. We've got a signal and we want to digitize it. We want to find certain things like what frequencies exist in that signal. Summations are all a part of that. Now, we have a notation that helps us do this. Assume we want to do the addition. Assume we want to add. So, assume we want to add the sequence. Let's say a sub m and a m plus 1 and a m plus 2 all the way up to a n minus 1 to a n. So we've got this sequence from a sub m all the way up to a sub n where we've got a being rep representative of an element in the sequence. So somewhere in this sequence, we want to take a whole group of them and add them together. Now the notation we use, it takes a capital sigma from the Greek alphabet. So this capital sigma is going to represent, we're going to do a summation. Now the lower limit or the start, so this is the lower limit, or the starting value, we're going to represent with m, but we need to have some sort of a counter, some sort of an identifier to say which element it is that we are in the process of adding. And so we are going to use, for the most part, or you know, in, in general, we use i a lot. Sometimes you may see a j uh, or a k, but I'm going to use an i here. So when i equals m, so that's the lower limit, and then we've got this n, which represents the upper limit. And that's going to be on the top of the sigma. So we're going to just simply say to n. So i equals m to n. And then we're going to sum these a sub i's together. Now, sometimes what you may see, especially in a lot of word processing programs or, or, or presentation software where they're trying to, to reduce the amount of vertical space, you may see this represented with a sigma. And then the i equals m to n written to the side of it. And so this way we get things squashed down a little bit so they have more room. In general, with what I'm going to be writing, you'll see it in this format. So let's do a couple of examples.
let's assume we want to add the first 10 positive integers. Now, pretty simple, right? We're just going to one, two, three, you know, add them all together, right? But how do we write this down? Well, using this notation that we have just been talking about, where we use the capital sigma, we go from i equals 1 up to 10, and so these are inclusive. So what we're looking at is every, every i that is greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 10, what we want to do is add a sub i where a sub i is equal to i. And so another way of doing this is to just simply say i is equal to 1 to 10, the summation of i. Now, let's go back to our room example. With our room example, remember I had that room i, so we had uh, room i had dimensions, the width was x sub i and the length was y sub i. And so how would we represent this using this new notation that we've been talking about? Well, remember, it had six rooms. So we're going from i equals 1 up to 6. Then remember this we, you know depending on what we're working with you know a lot of computer you know a lot of computer applications start counting from 0 so you may see that starting like 0 to 5 but in this case we're just going to go ahead and say i equals 1 up to 6 we're going to add x sub i times y sub i all right and that will give us the total square footage or the overall area floor area of this six room house that we've got. Now, there are a couple of things that, uh, that we can do mathematically with this summation. You know, anytime you've done it, had any experience with math, you've probably encountered these things called laws, right? And so, for example, there's this thing called the distributive law. And the distributive law said, well, here's just a quick example using variables. So if I have a times the sum of b plus c, and that's the same thing as a times b plus a times c. In other words, I can distribute that a across that sum using the multiplication. Turns out we can do a very similar thing with the summation. If I have a times the summation from i equals 0 up to, let's just simply say n, of x sub i, and so I'm just simply summing these, the, all of this, this sequence of x's together. If I were to write that out, I would get something like a times x sub 0 plus x sub 1 plus x sub 2 plus all the way up to x sub n, right? Well, if we go back to this distributive law, this distributive law says that I can take that a and multiply it across each one of the x's in the sum, which would give me a times x sub 0 plus a times x sub 1 plus a times x sub 2 plus all the way up to a times x sub m. Now, this actually looks a little bit like I'm taking this term plus this term plus this term plus this term, which is a summation, right? And so this is equal to the summation from i equals 0 up to n of a times x sub i. So you can actually take that a and distribute it or multiply it into the summation just as you would with the distributive law. And in fact, the same is true the other way. If I had something like the summation from i equals, we'll just say 1 to m of b times y sub i, that's equal to b, where b is a constant, times the summation from i equals 1 to m of y sub i. So you can pull it out just like you can multiply it in. There are other laws too that we can apply. Let's look at this summation. I've got the summation from i equals 0 up to n of x sub i plus y sub i. 
All right. Now, this only works for an addition inside because remember the summation, we can start moving things back and forth. There are a couple of laws, specifically the associative law and the commutative law in mathematics, which allow us to rearrange the terms and regroup the terms across an addition. But let's go ahead and write this guy out. What I've got is x sub zero plus y sub zero plus x sub 1 plus y sub 1 plus all the way up to x sub n plus y sub n. All right. Now, what we can do now is use the commutative law. And if you remember the commutative law, and in fact, we're kind of applying the associative law here. Remember, the commutative law says I can swap things. I can rearrange them. The associative law says I can regroup them. So I can ungroup these and basically get by the associative law x sub 0 plus y sub 0 plus x sub 1 plus y sub 1 plus all the way up to x sub m plus y sub m. And the commutative law says, you know, I can rearrange this. And if I rearrange this, I can get x sub 0 plus x sub 1 plus all the way up to x sub n plus y sub 0 plus y sub 1 plus all the way up to y sub m. And the associative law says, I can group these, right? Now, by grouping these, what you may see is that I've got a little summation here. I've got a summation that, uh, of x's and I've got a summation of y's. So this actually becomes the summation from i equals zero up to n of x sub i plus, and that's what comes from this guy, and then plus the summation from i equals zero up to n of y sub i. And so by using the associative and the commutative laws of mathematics, I can actually separate this summation. I can separate those two added terms, pull them apart in order to create two, summations, two separate summations. Now, turns out you can nest summa summations too, but this starts to get a little bit messy. This is not quite as pretty as being able to apply the commutative, associative, and distributive laws to summations. But you could, in fact, have an expression that looks like this, something where i equals 0 to n, and the, excuse me, the summation from i equals 0 to n, and then inside of that have another summation. And this summation will have a different identifier. So I may put, I don't know, j equals 0 up to m, and then maybe say x sub i times y sub j. All right. And by doing this, what I can actually have is do the summation of this across all the y's, then sum across all the x's. Now, to give you an example of this, well, let's put it this way. It may help, you underst help to understand if I give you an example of this. Let's just go ahead and say that, I don't know, how about uh, the summation from i equals 0 up to 3? of the summation from j equals, we'll say, 1 to 4, all right? And we'll have i times, how about j squared? Now, what I've done is giving you actual explicit expressions for what x sub i is. So what I'm saying in this case is that x sub i is just equal to i, and then y sub i, or excuse me, y sub j is equal to j squared. And so this will give you a, an, explicit, an explicit expression to represent each one of these elements up here. Well, what we've got is a summation for each i equals 0 up to 3, we'll have i. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this i out because inside of this summation, for each time you execute this summation, i is going to be a constant. First, we're going to do a constant for i equals 0. And I just realized that I did a multiplication there. <laughs> Not quite very good. A whole bunch of those are going to go away, aren't they? But anyway, so for, the, for i equals 0, we're going to do this summation. And so i is going to be a constant for that, that 
particular iteration. And then we're going to increment i up to 1. And then we're going to do this summation again for i equals 1. It'll be a constant. So I'm going to go ahead and pull i out of this summation and just simply say that we're going to have the summation from 1 to 4 of j squared. So that's going to be 1 plus 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, and 4 squared is 16. All right. Now, we're going to go ahead and add this up, and then we're going to go ahead and do the summation across all of the i's. So we've got, what is this? So 4 plus 16 is 20, uh, 1 plus 9 is 10, so that's 30. So this is actually equal to the summation for i equals 0 up to 3 of i times 30, which is going to be equal to, well, when i is equal to 0, that's 0 times 30. Yeah, I know. Plus 1 times 30 plus 2 times 30 plus 3 times 30. And that's going to give us 0 plus 30 plus 60 plus 90, which is going to give us, what is that, 180? Okay. And so, yes, you can, in fact, nest summations together in order to, uh, you know, make more complex operations. Whenever we get to computing, when we start talking about programming, you're going to see that this is something, what, something similar to what we call a nested loop, going through iterations inside of something that's going through iterations. All right. So why did I drag you through this material? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. If you get good at understanding how to re represent these things on paper, you'll get really good at being able to represent them in your code.